Hey guys, welcome to the Podtendo podcast. It's been the first, I don't know, five, ten minutes kind of rambling about random topics, just really not accomplishing a lot. And then around that mark, I'll put usually a sound clip, whether it's from the game or like a commercial or something, and then we'll get into the show proper. So if you're here, just listen to the game, skip ahead. Uh, if this is the first episode you're listening to, thanks for listening. If not, we'll kind of get into our weird little gen- banter, whatever you want to call it. So Tyson, how's it going? Good, good. How are you? Hey, you know, you know me, same old G. So, uh, we had some pretty exciting news. Was that last week or something like that? We got our first ever fan email. So, ha, everyone who didn't and listens, someone That's beat you to it. <coughs> very exciting news. Mm hmm. Very exciting news indeed. So, got an email that says Awesome podcast from Sh- John David Perot. Hey, guys. I've been listening to your stuff for a few months now, especially when I'm on the road or on or even hiking. You review a lot of games I've played on the Super Nintendo and I dusted all I dust God damn it. <laughs> I can't even read this email. <laughs> uh, I've been listening to your stuff for a few months now, especially when I'm on the road or even hiking. You review a lot of the games I've played on the Super Nintendo that I dust off every now and then. Great idea to put some historical perspective with Simpsons episodes and movies movies released at that time. Always cool to listen and support Canadian podcasts. Shout out from Quebec. Five stars. So thanks, John David. I mean, I can't read, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not John David's uh, fault. That's That's yours. Yeah, that's yeah. He actually it was all written well. I just stupid and can't read. So oh well, shucks. It happens. Shucks. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was good. So uh, thank you. I, I did reach out to him and offer him. Uh, we, like we have a, like running contests that are all now not valid. Just as of this podcast, FYI, so you can't like apply for like a Dragon Quest game. Because that's not a thing anymore. Uh, but thanks for reaching out to us. Uh, very first one. Maybe there's more to come. Uh, great to hear that you guys are actually out there listening. Uh, and no support. Any support. It's all good. So, yeah. Yeah, we greatly appreciate it. Pretty cool. Extremely exciting news. I, I just... Uh, it's neat to actually get kind of feedback that people are actually listening. Other than just us and our significant others and family members. So, yeah pretty cool yeah no that's awesome uh and uh up until the fact that like we blow up or we're like we're, we don't we're not interested yeah uh, you probably can't get an email read on the air <laughs> properly that's a different story <laughs> so, uh, but any emails tweets that you guys do send to us we'll get the information the contact info just in a little bit here uh and i mean it works so that's really exciting because i was like maybe our email doesn't work who knows yeah who knows? I, I haven't tested it or checked it, so... Yeah, I've never actually sent anything from it, so... Huh. Mm. Shoot. Shoot, mm. shoot. Nice. All right, well, I'm just drinking this, like, really terrible smoothie that I was telling Tyson about. It's just lettuce and, like, a little protein powder and some ice. Tastes just like ice and protein powder and lettuce, you know? <laughs> That's very unfortunate. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where, like... <sighs> you, you almost... You, you can't replicate how they make good smoothie uh like when those like juice bars like uh jugo juice or boosted juice basically it's got <sighs> juice in the title they're probably pretty good at making one of those darn things i don't know i did a good one yesterday where i had like a banana and i had just a little bit of lettuce and i think i put too much lettuce in this one and with no banana and then i skimped out on my frozen strawberry so i could have more tomorrow and i think i put a little splash of milk rather than no milk so i think if you like do all the balances better it's better, but sometimes you just get, you know, ice and lettuce, and you mix it up, and it tastes like icy lettuce. It's gross. Yeah, yeah. You have to, you have, to have a pretty decent blender for that stuff. Yeah, well, we're, yeah, we've got, like, a Vita, Vitamix. It seems pretty intense, so. Hmm. But, uh, you know, you know, you know. But, you know, the price of eating vegetables. Yeah, well, it's it's easier to, like, if, if you look at, like, a big old plate of, like, lettuce, it's going to be hard to eat all that, but if you throw all that in a blender and you blend it up, and you, you can easily drink that. Yeah, that's kind of what my thoughts were. My thoughts, exactly. So, that was a terribly red fan mail and some vitamins. What can't we give you on Potendo? 
I don't know. We're just too exciting. We are too goddamn exciting. Let's get on to the show proper. Or maybe adventure lies beyond the snowy skies With a purpose and a friend waiting just around the bend Winter's gonna be long. This winter's gonna be long. Hey guys, welcome to the Podtendo Podcast, where we analyze, reminisce, and replay the glory of old Nintendo games. We can be contacted by email at podtendo at gmail.com. Check us out on Twitter at, at Podtendo Podcast. Check us out on Facebook.com at Facebook.com slash Podtendo and on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Podtendo. Is that everything? Email, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I think that's it, right? I think so. Nice. I am your co-host, uh, Leisure Pants Mick. Did I steal that from Tyson? Or has that always been me? No. No, okay. I've you know, generally gonna, stuck gonna, to two things. I'm going to be the Rubik's Cube Master again. I'm Rubik's Cube Master, Mick. And I'm joined yeah. every episode by my co-host. Uh, Chancellor Tyson. Man, my intros have really, like, fallen off. You know, like, I started doing it without script, and I forgot about, like, my little sayings. Yeah. I'm just having a terrible day. I need to have more lettuce. <laughs> really makes you wonder how those uh, talk show hosts can go there, like, five days out of the week and just be pretty decent like i mean they're not great but they have to be on like at least you know four out of the five nights that'd be so tough well it's like raps right the more you do it i mean the fact that we only do this every couple maybe once a month every couple weeks and then i mean i'm sitting off script like watching tv they're sitting with like a teleprompter and getting paid for it so true if we were if we were making money we'd probably pay more attention so wouldn't would we i don't know it seems i don't pay attention i'm attention to my job so yeah true that yeah yeah not at all uh anything from the last episode i don't think so i think we're all caught up uh but as you guys might notice we're playing the second part of earthbound 2 that means we've completed now four big rpgs for the super nintendo so pretty exciting stuff, you know. Yeah, big, big accomplishment. I, mm-hmm. uh, I was, I was thinking about the other day. It's like, what games haven't we done? And the list is not that long. So. Yeah, well, like there's, but I mean, like of the big RPGs that everyone talks about, we definitely have to play Final Fantasy three. We definitely have to play probably Secret of Mana. Like, there's a game called Terra Nigma, but I don't really have any interest in playing Terra Nigma because it was never released in north america like it's only ever released in europe Hmm. so like Hmm. i kind of feel like i'm like i don't really what about um what was it evo does that count as an rpg uh i I feel like that'd be like in the same vein of act razor right where it's kind of an rpg but again it's it's not really you know if Hmm. that's fair yeah that's fair right like it's kind of more like an action rpg not like a turn-based very true yeah. very true and the story is basically a <laughs> paragraph yeah you're the the planet wants you to become its mate so it turns you into a fish and sees if you can live on it because mm-hmm. that makes sense so playing earthbound part two i did a little something different with the notes today we're gonna look at the virtual console release of this game and just talk a little bit about how it came to be the release date of this was march 1st 2013 on the virtual console how long to beat has this game at 28 hours i figure i must have put about i don't know 25 hours into this game like legit so i'm feeling pretty good about that tyson how long did you play this game for yeah probably like 30 some okay price at release was 12 dollars on the wii u virtual console eBay price, $12 for a reproduction. Reproduction. Is that the right word? Yes. Okay. Card, not reproductive. Hmm, there it is. I should have just kept reading. Never doubt the notes, Mick. Never doubt them. And $200 plus for an original copy of this game. eShop price, $12 on the Wii U and 
certain 3DS. If we look at the development details of Earthbound Part 2, or just, I guess, Earthbound, I don't know why I'm keep calling it that, uh, there was a sequel announced initially for this game three years later for the Nintendo 64 DD, entitled Earthbound 64 or Mother 3. However, the game became plagued by problems as the release and the release date pushed back, as well as failures to appear at popular gaming conventions like E3 hurt the eventual release of this game. Nintendo eventually announced its cancellation in August 21st, 2000. Years later, Mother 3 resurfaced as a Game Boy Advance title and was released only in Japan. On May 5th, 2005, some guy, I don't know, I can't really say that name, Shigesato Itoi, maybe I got it, announced that he had no new plans to develop Mother series any further. After the development of the Wii system, it was expected that Earthbound would be released on the virtual console, but due to supposed copyright issues involving music sampling and Nintendo of Japan's refusal to let the game be modified, it was stated that Earthbound would never be released outside of Japan. However, however, during the Nintendo Direct show on April 17th, 2013, uh, Nintendo announced that Earthbound will be released for the Wii U's virtual console in North America and Europe in 2013. The Japanese already had a re-released version in March that same year. Oh, okay, there you go. On July 18th, 2013, Earthbound was suddenly released on the Wii U virtual console and for $9.99. As, as for August 13th, Earthbound is the number one on the virtual console in most Europe and second place in America, behind Donkey Kong. So... I got the wrong date, Tyson. How about that? That does happen. Oh, man. Oh, what a but, silly bugger. Yeah. Well, oh well. I, I don't fact check your notes, so you can blame that one on me. It's true. I do send your like the notes like in advance. Do you ever look at them, or do you just like kind of like pull them up as we're going when we start the show? Uh, I think call them to more often than not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, there's no wrong answers here on Pontendo. We're all full of right answers, even when we're just making up random nonsense. So it's yeah. a good time, you know? Yeah. Uh, because the development details... So that's actually kind of what we want to talk about. Uh, so the Mother 3 was developed for the Super Nintendo uh, 64DD, which was kind of a disc console for the Nintendo 64. They were going to partner with Oh man, this is like a whole bag of worms. Basically, it didn't work. And as a result, the Sony PlayStation came to be because Nintendo didn't want to work with Sony to create a disc based gaming system because they were like, man, cartridges. That's where it's at. Not this stupid disc stuff, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think that they could somehow make a cut on the, the profits of uh, the hardware, some crazy thing, and the discs mm. were just too easily reproduced and it came down to kind of like yeah anyways, that's a whole can of, that's a that's a big can of worms yeah that we so basically, take a whole episode to even get into yeah so basically mother was a beloved series so there's mother this is earthbound is technically mother 2 mother 3 does exist there's a fan translation game out there that you can get it seems fairly beloved and well respected uh it's kind of dead in the water right now and coming through there's there's sampling problems, right? Like when this game came out, uh, some of the songs they use in the game definitely sound like copyrighted songs that exist in North America. But one of the issues is in Japan, they're, you know what? They, they're like, we're going to use these copyrights, put them out, make money. If you can find a lawyer that can speak both, both English and Japanese and come sue us and like take us to court and you want to pay like hundreds of millions of dollars to get your 10 million, like your five million dollars go for it you know yeah yeah and so i'm sure of... international law is a real difficult thing to get into yeah so they kind of just go with that but as a release some of these virtual uh releases do suffer obviously they've kind of figured out the legal stuff so we're seeing it on the wii u which i've played it before and own a copy uh the 3ds i don't have a 3ds that can play those fun games and the snes classic so it's exciting stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's nice to see that as this franchise is kind of dead in the water, that the releases keep 
are happening like uh the 3ds release was not too long ago and then out comes the snes classic you're like so it seems like it's more available than it was even like 10 years ago imagine very, trying to find that game yeah oh, yeah very true very true and then I mean, that's what drives up the uh the going rate of carts for this game too right so true but because i didn't have very many development details even though we still talked about it for some part we're gonna look at trivia the advertisement slogan for earthbound when it was first released it had the slogan this game stinks this may or may not have contributed to the game receiving poor reception in america when it first was released if the player uh, accesses the debug mode the iconic Nintendo character Kirby will appear as a cursor. Up and until April 24th, 2014, Earthbound's Miiverse community incorrectly labeled it as a Nintendo Entertainment System game instead of a Super Nintendo Entertainment System game. <laughs> Stupid. Many sound effects were recycled for Kirby's Dream Course as both games were developed side by side. The town names in this game represent the order that they're in. Did you know that? Did you get the joke of one it and yes. Tucson and three and four side? Yeah. By about it's... three three side, you're like, okay, I get it. Man, this trivia is pretty great. I'm glad I made up these notes months ago and didn't ever proofread them. So, And if the pirated version of Earthbound is downloaded, additional enemies will be added, and when Porky Minch turns off the devil machine the game will reset and erase saved files so i'm glad i didn't play a pirated version of this game <laughs> yeah right that would just be devastating. also kind of a good way of like saying a fuck you to people is re-releasing these roms of these games and then putting in stupid like like right towards the end of the game all of a sudden the final battle is like and now my final attack and he just like resets all your game data and you're like oh fuck oh. yeah <clears throat> i would be pretty like uh, pretty devastated. That was actually just like in the game for real, but only those pirates got to worry about only that. Only those pirates. On to the control section of this game. Getting back into it, I really enjoyed uh, the equipment selection. Having your characters kind of flash when you are uh, you can get equipment to improve their controls, uh, I, and so kind of notes going forward. So if you've never played it, you are th thinking about playing it, you're not really sure what to expect from earthbound uh this game's world isn't huge so never be afraid to explore and get lost so yes it seems big and the desert seems scary and you might want to just stick to the outskirts but like honestly walking through the whole desert or going through the whole swamp areas it's worth it and checking out all the caves because it's not that big of a world it's not as big as a final fantasy where yes you can spend hours and hours in a dungeon and as well as there's that kind of that nice safety net where you die you just get sent back to the, like the last save point and you can save and you don't lose anything but money so don't be afraid to explore yes uh especially since uh you know this is like you're kind of overpowered at this point so running back through old dungeons isn't mm -hmm. the most painful oh. thing in the world it's pretty pretty easy you'd be surprised yeah i so. mean you do get teleport uh beta so instead of having to like run frantically across the screen you just do little circles which helps you teleport so you don't have to be like fine long stretches of road and as well as seeing enemies on the overworld instead of random encounters is a lifesaver so you have the opportunity to you get to those higher levels you have to backtrack you can like plow through the enemies or they just run out of your way and you can ignore them so at some parts of the game you can just run through them and not even worry about it so like getting back into this game the uh, biggest thing i would say just for anyone even maybe thinking about playing it it's not intimidating at all so give it a try yeah definitely um if i haven't played this game before and this is like my first playthrough um i kind of feel like uh, i missed something not playing this game but i think i'm getting ahead of myself so i should probably move on to the wayback machine wait or the controls no, we're done with the controls. Way back machine. Okay. Nice. Uh, yeah, so I never said retrospective. <laughs> One day I will say retrospective before the 15-minute mark of this podcast. Uh, only uh, someday, someday. Uh, so the way this works, especially as a second part of a show, uh, is we don't spend too much time 
uh, looking at kind of how it came to be, uh, we look at different aspects of it. Uh, but one thing that is consistent through all the shows that we do is we look at the Wayback Machine and we decide if we want to live in the time period that this came out. So we're specifically looking for March 1st, 2017, I think, or maybe August 2017. I don't know. We'll find out when I, we start looking at... Yeah, I think it's March. March 1st, 2013. Favorite shows. Could it be The Simpsons? Pulpit Fiction? Reverend Lovejoy leaves his pulpit after a charismatic new minister usurps him and finds a new job as a hot tub salesman. While Homer's newfound devotion and work as a deacon starts to annoy Bart. Sounds pretty great, right? Mm. Eh. Have you seen that episode of The Simpsons? I have not. I've not watched a lot of new Simpsons. All right. Or Suits. A smart, high-powered lawyer hires a guy who didn't even go to law school, and they wear suits. I think it's a drama, even though I made it sound kind of like a comedy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it is a parody of itself at this point. So, But specifically, you could be watching the episode War. A British firm headed by Edward Darby decides to sneak in uh, with a tempting offer for Jessica's firm, clashing with Harvey's plan for a future and Jessica's own vision, and leaving them both to make up their own minds on which direction they want to take their careers. Luis meets his match uh, in the form of Darby's quartermaster, Nigel, as the, the two f try to find a way to keep both their jobs viable in a new combined firm. Harvey, Harvey makes a wager to Edward, which would stop the merger should Harvey win on a case in which is later handed over to Mike. However, Jessica threatens Mike. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, I saw that wall of text and I was like, good on you, man. Like, go. For I think it. I had it, but like, I just got bored of reading. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Simpsons. Oh, my God. <laughs> Woo, Simpson! Yeah, I remember we tried watching yeah. Suits at one point, and it's just fucking dumb. Like, uh, it's like lawyer jargon. We're attractive people in suits. Lawyer jargon. You're also attractive, and you're a girl in a girl suit. Lawyer, lawyer jargon. Suits. Yeah, let, let's walk somewhere and pretend and give somebody to drive us around because yeah. lawyers. Oh, man. Ugh. All right, other TV shows that were out. So I'll be honest with you, 2013, not looking great. Other t No, it's definitely lower tier so far. If anyone's oh. keeping track of the yeah, rankings. Other TV shows. We could watch Big Bang Theory, Parks and Rec, Hannibal, Mad Men, The Walking Dead, and The Breaking Bad. The Breaking Bad! <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll be honest with you. Eh, it's not, uh, nothing, nothing standing out there. Parks and Rec is funny. Yeah. It's kind of like, it, yeah, it, I don't know. It's like The Office, but slightly more modern, Yeah, I guess. Yeah, fair enough. Well, maybe there's cartoons that will you know, convince us that this is a good year to live in. So, we could watch The Day My Butt Went Psycho, The Adventures of Napkin Man, <laughs> <laughs> Monsters vs. Aliens, or... Avengers Assemble, so... Eh. <laughs> oh There's my no goodness. way that that's a real thing. Adventures of Napkin Man? Like, did I make that they, up? No, I you can't be. Cause I, this can't be a thing. Adventures of Nap... Oh my god, it is a real thing. What the fuck? Oh, it's literally a Napkin Man. Huh. Alright. Good job, CBC kids. <laughs> 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 Ooh. yep Ooh, indeed uh. but i mean okay so tv's not great you know we're not watching great tv maybe we can go to the movies and see some great movies we could watch 21 and over the battle for pussy willow creek the lax last exorcism part two and jack the giant slayer Ooh. Yeah, th this is this this is so bad. This might be the worst time period that we've been in. No, some, we can bring <laughs> it back. Come on, video games. Like this is great. We got 
Some yeah. video games are going to redeem us. Castlevania, Lord of Shadows, Mirror of Fate. So it's Castlevania, Lord of Shadows, Dash, Mirror of Fate. Uh, Metal Gear Rising. Oh, Metal Gear. Oh, it's Metal Gear Rising, Revengeance. Shoot. Sly Cooper, Thieves in Time. Any of those doing anything for you? No, unfortunately. All right. So, to be honest with you, 2013, you seem like a fucking shitty year, so... <laughs> This is the definitely like the, one of the worst <laughs> years that we have been. Oh, we in, can bring so. it back though. We got three songs to look at. The top three songs for March first, twenty thirteen. Uh, how about the number three song, "Locked Out of Heaven" by Bruno? Mars, you know, like I, uh, he's kind of I don't know, like quirky, but like some of his love songs are kind of fun, and I feel like a love song is the best way for me to define if a genre is great. So the reason I don't think I like hip hop or like rap as much is because I've never heard like a rap love song that like stands out to me, you know, that like defines a genre that makes like evoke some type of emotion from me. Whereas like Bruno Mars, once in a while, I'm like eh, it's kind of he's harmless. Oh man, that's. No, I think, but didn't he just win a Grammy or something? Yeah, like, like so. Bruno Mars is good. He's, he's harmless. I'll say that's, like, I think that's the nicest way I can put it. He's harmless. But or how yeah, about the number but... two song, Thrift Shop by Macklemore? What are your thoughts on Macklemore? <laughs> I don't know, he's white. <laughs> yeah. He, he makes uh, piss jokes, so yeah. that's... I don't know. He has that one song about like the Mariners uh, winning the pennant or something like that, or winning a playoff series that I really like. But other than that, Macklemore doesn't really do it for me. Yeah, he doesn't do it for all me All right, either. 2013, it all comes down to this. We need to have literally the greatest song ever written be the number one song or we're not coming back to you in fact we might send time bombs and blow it up so people just forget about you the number <laughs> one song according to the billboard charts was the harlem shake by bauer the harlem shake. A song only popular, I think, because of the viral videos that came out, but still, there's no way that should be a top song. I've already sent it. I just pressed, I didn't even ask for your permission. I just sent a time bomb back in time, so. Yeah, no, fuck that. Like, like seriously, shitty TV shows. <laughs> what the fuck is Napkin Man? <laughs> shitty movies, mediocre video games, and those are the three best songs that you can produce. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Oh man! All right, this, this is not good. No, what a what a real kick in the rumpkins, you know? <laughs> yeah, thank God for Earthbound. No wonder the people were looking in the past. They were like, anything that out currently sucks. Yeah. So let's look to the. Well, on the plus side, we never have to go back to 2013. Like, if we get a time machine, we can just skip that year. So. True. Yeah. True. But with our luck, we'll accidentally end up there yeah, somehow. The worst. The worst ever. Uh, let's look at so the next section. I feel like this show is like, going to be like a little bit out of order because I made these notes. I've been writing these notes for like two months now, and I just keep adding in sections. So the next part is we're going to be looking at the cultural significance of Earthbound. I, so yeah, I, I racked my brain for a bit and couldn't think how this game kind of impacted our culture slash society. Uh, I looked at references. Uh, maybe some odd influences, like it was uh, referenced in a weird show, or maybe <sighs> Fuzzy Pickles, like their catchphrase, I don't know, took off. I really couldn't come up with anything, but then it dawned on me. It's not what this game is, it's what this game left as a legacy. Being cited as one of the most amazing RPGs to have ever existed is a great legacy, but that's not always, it wasn't always that way. Due to the childish, quote, graphics, in an era where graphics could make or break your game, 
this game was originally overlooked. Often cited as being a cult classic. So let's look at some other cult classics and just how they impact us. Uh, and, and, and the impact on current prices of original copies. Are you ready for this? Jim Tyson, do you know what sure. a cult classic is? Yes, I do. All right, so by definition, it is something, typically a movie or book, that is popular or fashionable amongst a particular group or sect of society. All right? So I looked at what other cult classics exist out there. Some other cult classic video games would be, are considered Red Dead Revolver, Zombies Ate My Neighbors, Medieval, and Diablo. Would you say those are cult classics? Yes, but I think when it comes to a cult classic, <clears throat> it, it kind of comes to a certain point and then just be kind of kind of eclipses it. Like it almost still needs to be like uh, something that every few years you can look into, and it's still like not overblown. But like you see, uh, it, I don't know, kind of this modern, modern age, it's so hard for things to stay called classic. I would say like. The Army of Darkness and Evil Dead franchise is still kind of a cult classic, but Diablo is like a multi-million dollar franchise, so maybe it's not, but I also don't know video game numbers that well, so I'll agree. Yeah, well, it, it, it's a cult classic was meant, like the term came because it was things that were had very low distribution rates, so one of the movies we'll get to has that, uh, so it was hard to um, obtain, but now the fact that you can go on the internet and you can literally find anything and anyone can share anything with anyone on YouTube or Facebook or, you know, like the world's so small right now. I think it's hard to find a cult classic because once something picks up steam, like I think Get Out would be a good example of a cult classic movie, except it was so like spread so quickly that the distribution had nothing to do with it in theaters, but it was like in the home movie, in the home uh, the box office, or at home box office, it took off, right? So through um, yeah. those demands. So I think like those things are probably a thing of the past. We probably won't see cult classics anymore, right? Because I mean, if you wanted to buy any game in the world, assuming you have a system for it, you can go and buy a digital copy. It's not like if you can't find a physical copy, you're out of place. Like, I mean, I guess the closest we have right now are the... Uh, NES and the SNES minis like those are almost cult classic these days just due to like the hardness to find yeah it, it does a rarity does need to come with uh, the status of being kind of a cult classic but um, when it comes to this game it's definitely overlooked like even though it's so available I don't know like I just feel like this game is just underplayed because it is kind of so Real, like so fantastic and i feel like if people uh who didn't play this in their childhood kind of missed out because that would have been the perfect time to play it. well we're learning that tyson really likes this game apparently uh yeah, so sorry. Let's, sorry let's look at some <laughs> cult classic tv shows so i pulled up a list of cult classic-y things and this is what i found buffy the vampire slayer arrested development mst3k so that's mystery science theater 3000 the x-files and it's always sunny in philadelphia do those would you call any of those cult classics maybe mst 3k yeah and like um, arrested development because arrested development is a it, like the first couple seasons anyways it is very well written it's very well received uh but due to the fact that just no one watched it i think it kind of went away but like yeah. buffy i thought buffy was a popular show me too i always thought it was kind of ranked highly maybe it was just like a kind of a dead space of time maybe it could, it could be one but, of those things that as it was out like it, it, it drew enough numbers for them to have like eight seasons and then once it was over all of a sudden this like fan base grew out of nowhere kind of thing right so it'd be like could be uh, i'd be like game of thrones game of thrones has been written for you know like 10 years and then it became popular but like it it should have been like does that make sense like that kind of like all of a sudden everyone just discovers this great work of literature that they like is a cultural like nut punch that's a terrible analogy <laughs> um but <laughs> uh but it's like already existed right so i mean i guess like in that case maybe you could say that uh early game of thrones books like if you were in on it in the 90s people been like you're a loser you like game of thrones and now people are like man game of thrones is sweet so 
Yeah, I think if you tell the average person when the first book came out, most people are shocked. So. All right, well, let's see if these movies maybe get us get us going. Cult classic movies like the Rocky Horror Picture Show, The Big Lebowski, Donnie Darko, The Warriors, The Evil Dead, Clerks, and The Room are all considered cult classic movies due to uh, initially poor or low distribution and the fact that they have avid fan bases. So I would say these are like this when I think cult classic, it's probably actually this list of movies right here. <laughs> yeah, definitely, especially since each one of these individually, you can just look at it and just see that or if you if you are a fan of it or if you are aware of it, you know that most people aren't. Or if you I feel like if you ask the average person about any of these movies, most people would probably just like draw a blank or unless it's kind of like evil dead now because i had the remake but even then like it, it you know what and it's exactly like this game it's great it's underappreciated not enough people play it talk about it whatever it is but i mean if you've watched the big lebowski then like you're like what a great little film it's funny True. it's quirky it... it's uh has a lot more to it than you'd think just like this game right so yeah so i i, I think those fit the uh, perfectly uh, but unfortunately with video games due to the fact that they don't uh, remake them and it was you know a, quite a long time almost 20 years between kind of the digital copy release and the physical copy release of this game uh, people were gouging people out the wazoos like there were so many gouged wazoos out there that <laughs> uh, that this game was overpriced and there's like way too much money floating around on this game so I looked up a list of you know what are what's a rare game and how expensive can rare games be so Tyson have you ever heard of the Nintendo World Championships yes so there was a contest in the 90s where it was you had to play like collect 20 coins in Super Mario play a level of Rad Racer and then like play Tetris like get to a score in Tetris or something and they made these special carts there's only you know 20 in existence or something like that and then there's like only a couple like championship editions a copy of one of these cartridges can go anywhere from twenty six thousand dollars to a hundred and forty thousand dollars in price at auction that's insanity there was another one called stadium events i don't know the history of this but a copy of this game can go for around sixty thousand dollars for the nes the asian version of super mario brothers is worth about $44,000. Why? I don't know. We build coffee tables out of Super Mario Brothers cartridges because there's so many. And in Asia, they're worth $44,000. Sometimes life's just not fair, you know? Life's just so strange and bitter. The rarity, right? Like, it's hard to find, I guess? Uh, and then the final one, Gamma Attack for the Atari 2600, which is valued at... One million dollars. Who would have figured anything on the Atari 2600 had any value? Yeah, that's kind of where that, that is. Uh, so I find yeah. it's not always the quality of the game that drives the value. Rather, it's the quantity of the game. Um, also, screw... Oh, okay. Uh, things that... So, and then just as a collector. So, I mean, I'm a collector. Uh, I'm moving and I'm getting a bunch of stuff from my parents. And I'm learning that I have just like boxes and boxes of useless crap. Uh, so some of the things just to think of is when you're trying to build a collection. Uh, or things that fuel, say, the collector's market. It's the quality of the items. The quantity of the items. And it's a collector's, a, a collector's desire to own that item that makes... Uh, you want to either buy or sell your items, right? So, I mean, I have a bunch of Marvel Universe toys. I don't know if there's a big mm -hmm. buyer's market right now for those currently. Um, after maybe the Marvel movies fizzle out and they, like, restart up in, like, 15, 20 years, they might be worth more than they would be right now. And it's one of those things, as a collector, you kind of have to just let them appreciate, right, and wait for the market to sell them, so. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> and the other thing is with, uh, time so like let's say even 40 years all the all those toys that are currently pretty available will be tossed in the garbage or disappear so every person that wants to be a perfect uh collector is looking for any sort of spare parts that they can kind of swap things onto or like whole pieces so there's there's usually a market for that shit and uh with time plastic degrades so 
toys seems to always just increase as uh as uh time goes on even if they're not in perfect quality or like even if they're not in great uh qu- like quality that you can still even get something for them it's amazing yeah, very true so that was kind of my cultural significance was cult classics collector's items and just overpriced shit so that's fair um the only thing <clears throat> i can think about for cultural significance is maybe no earthbound maybe no south park video games or maybe we get different looking south park video game oh man maybe they go they they try to go something a little bit more like skyrim and a little like less uh open world rpg yeah oh i yeah i could see that maybe yeah because i suppose and you know what even like we'll get into it a little bit but without this game does pokemon exist i know man like that's kind of one of the things i see the most is i'm like man like this like pokemon and this are like i think hold hands quite a bit so yeah the definitely the style yeah. for sure i think i have a note about that though for uh like final thoughts or whatever so we will come back to that topic but i like where tyson's head is at first memories of this game like i stated in the first show i don't really have any um i did listen to the retro rpg and continue cast podcast on this game and heard it was really good but due to that kind of that irrational fear I have um, of get going like too far into a game and getting stuck or like losing progress, I didn't play it. I also question people who claim that this game is great but never finish it. I'm looking at you, Podtendo Podcasts Top 10 Super Nintendo Game List. Oh, we're addressing that. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Tyson, any current thoughts or first thoughts or first memories you want to add for that until we get into uh, a recap of the story and the level notes? <clears throat> Not overly, but I now that we're a pretty far ways into this game, you can kind of see how how uh, how it looks and how it's shaped. It's it this like pacing of the game is pretty decent actually kind of it never feels like you're waiting around for anything or trying to grind things out it always feels like you're taking the next step to kind of on your journey yeah so oh yes yeah. oh yes all right so let's move on to story recap we are ness a child of destiny and we are told by a bee from the future that we have to save the world we set off from home to find our chosen friends paula jeff and Pooh, to unlock eight sound stones that we might battle gaius we fight an ant Stop a cult, rescue Paula, get caught by zombies, get rescued by Jeff, fight a circus tent and a big pile of garbage, and stop an evil statue from controlling a city. And that brings us to today. Dun dun dun. So exciting. So this game, uh, we and we haven't even gotten that far that far so far. Yeah, I, I know. I thought that. So we wanted to end the game when we got Pooh, but for some reason we got to this town called Summers. And then kind of just stopped playing. Yeah. So we... I think it was like a timing thing. I don't know what it was. I think we were kind of just burnt out after fighting like the statue. And I was like, man, what a tough battle that was. I think what we said. Yeah. I think it's Reverse City. It's that. That's what did it. That's... It's so hard to look at. Yeah, Moonside was pretty difficult. So we found out that Pokey was in Summers, but left for some reason. As we find try to find a ship that will take us across the sea, uh, we end up being drugged. We then take control of Pooh, like literally five minutes <laughs> into this playthrough. He's a young prince who just finished up his training, so we have to head to a sacred hill. Did you fall for the girl's trick? I don't remember. So you're as Pooh and you're meditating, and all of a sudden this little girl come up and says, Oh, your master says you need to come back. Please uh, oh, come back right no. now. And I... Or the other option is you don't move, like you wait another 30 seconds. Uh, this battle initiates where this like spirit comes and you lose your arm. He breaks your legs and arms and takes your body and then it's just your mind. And you learn about your PSI powers. Or if you're like Mick, you go back and you talk to your master and he's like, go do your training. And I was like, what the hell? And she comes out again and I was walk- like, I did it twice. And I was like, god damn it. And then I realized it was a joke. This game. Yeah. Very cle- very very clever now. That's twice now that they've used the whole like just don't do anything. Mm-hmm. But so. Pooh, when he joins us, does have teleportation power. So he teleports to Ness and the gang. In me, Tyson. 
Oh, to re rejoin. And me and Tyson, Tyson both head across the sea. Or we could go to the museum and uh, get a call from the Foresight Museum. Check it out and find our way into the Foresight sewers. At the end of the sewers, we fight Boss, the pla Plague Rat. Uh, he wasn't super difficult, but by fighting him, we unlock a soundstone, that's five, and we get a carrot key. There was a cave near in Dalum, that's where Pooh is from, uh, and we fight our way through it to get to Pink Cloud, and we've got our sixth soundstone, so it's pretty exciting. So did you do that before or after you went across the sea? Well, I went across the sea and you were like, no, don't do that. So I loaded up one of my past save states. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So, my life. Fair enough. So, I have a confession. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I have an irrational fear of getting to a point in a game where I get stuck. So in RPGs, I spend needless hours grinding just to get past a boss. Uh, or, you know, like running out of ammo in a survival horror game. So to counteract this, I spend hours prepping and grinding early on in the game so I don't incur this later in the game. That doesn't make any sense, does it? No, no, it, it makes total sense. <laughs> You're completely rational in this fear. Really? And, and some very unforgiving video games have taught us this. Okay. Because there's some games where, like, for me, this was Final Fantasy X. I got basically up mountain and i didn't like at all level one of the characters that you're forced to use during that i'm not gonna spoil any of this but basically i got to a point where i had a boss battle and i could grind out a little bit before but all the bad guys are so strong that using him he just died and it was really hard to keep him alive so it was no i i get, I get that when you get to a place sometimes you to, like get to a, a bad matchup and you're just fucked and you have to backtrack even further so it's yeah, it's it's a nightmare. So I, that's a rational fear for okay. sure. Okay, okay, awesome. Thanks for validating my weird fear that I have. But now that we have Anytime. we have those two soundstones, the, the probably the right way we should do it, or you could do what Nick and Tyson did: jump on the boat and you head across the sea where the Kraken attacks. He hit pretty hard, and I think all but I think. Ness was still alive and I forget if someone else I think maybe Pooh made it but Jeff and Paula definitely died so poor guys yeah it's hard to keep everybody alive in boss battles you want everybody to get that experience but sometimes yeah you just gotta move yeah, on very true so next we are off into a desert town there isn't really anything interesting here so we head to the pyramids to the south we use a code that we get from the museum so that was beneficial uh, and I really, for some reason, like the I liked the design of the pyramid. So you start at the bottom, and you work your way kind of up. At the very top, there's a throne room, and then you work your way kind of down a set of stairs. Just like the shape of a pyramid. I don't know. I was like, I mean, I made a note about it, so obviously it stood out. We get the falcon stone, or something like the raven crest. It was some bird-related thing, which helps us get to the other side of the pyramid. On the other side of the, the pyramid, Star Dude shows up and takes Pooh away to train. So we head into Dungeon Man. Brick Road built a big Dungeon Man in, uh, inside this statue, and our job is to find him. Afterwards, Dungeon Man, who's this giant jumping, like, stone... No, what is it? what are those called? Stonehenge? No. Easter Island? Yeah, Easter yeah. Island head. Easter Island head guy joins our party. He gets blocked by some palm trees, and... We learn we need a submarine, so off to Subway. That's not a uh, that's not a funny joke. That's not a funny joke at all, Mick. <laughs> he's a he's a pretty cool like big dude that just follows you around on the uh, overworld. Yeah, and kind of helps us attack and whatnot. And then we have to go inside and get a submarine because Brick Road, who builds these dungeons and is like this weird head in the wall guy. Uh, gives us a submarine so that we can get to the darkness. Scary. Uh, mm -hmm. Darkness is a d jungle, and you need the stone thing uh, to light up the blackness. Otherwise, you're just walking around in the dark. Uh, I don't think the jungle area was super difficult. It was, again, one of those things where, like, an irrational fear where I didn't want to, for some reason, uh, search too much. 
for like no apparent reason because I was afraid of being stuck. Nothing was super difficult, right? Uh, we do meet a reincarnation of Master, Master Belch called Vomit that we can take out fairly simply. Tyson, are we having troubles with any of the enemies or bosses at this point? No. Okay. <clears throat> I was pretty like over leveled and um, always had the best equipment. So. Nice. Yeah. As long as you're like not mindlessly just mashing your way through this game and you kind of approach each enemy accordingly, you're fine. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Where were we? We left off somewhere. I moved my page. What was I thinking? Uh, at the end of darkness, we find a bunch of shy creatures who hint that there's a book that will make them less shy. Apple Kid calls and let us know that he is at Stonehenge and has a book called Pe Making People Less Shy. How convenient. We make our way back to Jeff's dad lab, find out Apple Kid as well as Jeff's dad's ja da ugh. Jeff's dad are missing, as well as acquire the eraser eraser. This gives us access to the area underneath Stonehenge, where we can fight robots and Starman. At the, at the very end of a futuristic base, we find that Apple Kid, Orange Kid, and Jeff's dad are all in tubes, and there's a very powerful Starman boss. But first, did you know that the yellow Starman, Starman Super, has a 1 in 128 drop rate for Pooh's only weapon in the game? Sword of Kings? I did know that. So I loaded <laughs> up on healing items, because I also knew this, and I spent probably two and a half hours trying to get the sword. Yikes. Um, I didn't get it, but on the plus side, when I was done, Ness was at level 85. No, that's fair. That's the nice thing about um, just kind of grinding out that, grinding out to try to even aim to get it. Every hour you spend on that basically makes every hour in the future so much more yeah, easy. very true. Very, very true. Uh, we do have to take out the Starman Deluxe. Uh, this was the first time I actually fought him, I died. So I got to the end of the mission, died, looked up the guide, found out about the drop rate, was like, I'll do some leveling. Uh, he has a shield, and if you use physical attacks, he takes lots of damage. But if you don't, uh, and you like use your PSI, they reflect back on your team and wipe you out. So, yikes. Uh, we do find uh, out that Apple Kid doesn't have the book. So we go check the one at library, return the book to the green guys, one of them is really strong and opens up a dungeon, uh, the la the lost dungeon. There are some fairly tough enemies here. Pooh's armor is also here, so you shouldn't miss that. And at the end, we fight the boss, Electro Spectre. Since I spent two hours grinding, I didn't really have any like problems with the rest of the game. Let's put it that way. So yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and I think as long as you're fairly careful. You're, you should be fine and if you have a guide you're set it's not that hard to follow what somebody says don't do this yeah, yeah very so. true uh we now at the after you fight electroshocker we get the seventh sanctuary and this is a kind of a cool one because it's a giant neon wall that reads ness's mind and there's a kind of a cool moment where he like he has he talks to the wall i don't know it's kind of yeah neat it's pretty <laughs> i really enjoyed it it was like one of those things where uh I, you don't expect just this random glowing wall to just start talking to you, but kind of sets up how this world is kind of bonkers. Things have been pretty straightforward up till now. Like you would walk into a building and have to leave through that building. Now it seems like you go into a dungeon and you could end up anywhere. Yeah, yeah very true. Because at the far side of this like lost underground uh, is... Oh, the Lost Underground, which is a giant world, and we're represented as just like these like tiny like two pixel high sprites that have to walk around in this giant map while giant dinosaurs attack us. Yeah, this is one of my favorite mm. parts. We find a Tenda village, and as soon as we get there, uh, these little green Tenda guys say, "Oh my God, what are you doing in the dinosaur's cage? Please, quickly, come in here so we are safe." And it's funny because there's like this little tiny ring of uh, fence, and they've clearly fenced in the dinosaurs yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's the opposite they, they got the uh built up a fence around their village and they call all everything on the outside they're like oh that's fenced in yeah stupid so. tendus. i thought it was funny i was like that's that's pretty good yeah. uh we do find that we find a rock here we talk to him and he tells us about our destiny and that the last sanctuary is to the south so we go to the fire string uh, fire springs which is a big maze 
Uh, I used the guide to know how to get here, and I found, or how to get through there, so, rather, and found the boss. Carbon Dog. He's a fire dog. Use ice attacks. Then he becomes Diamond Dog. He's a bit tougher, but again, like, I was, like, super overpower buffed. Nothing was really stopping me at this point, so good job, me. We do mm-hmm. find the final sanctuary, and after hearing the completed tune of all the soundstones, we are teleported to Mag- Magicant? Ma- Magicant? Ma- Magicant? I don't know how you say that. Mm. Magicant? Magicant. Which is, a rep- re- which is a representation of our brain. We can talk to NPCs, buy some equipment. I would uh, stock up on PP restoring items. Grab a flying man, who's kind of like a little partner, because you're basically just Ness, and start battling random enemies. And it's pretty cool little area. There's like giant carrots and tomatoes, and when you talk to people, it changes the mm-hmm. different color palette. So Yeah, very neat. Uh, and in the Japanese version of this game, when Ness was in his brain, he was completely naked. But in this version, because you can't show that, he was wearing underwear. Fair yeah, enough. Fair enough. Uh, once you kind of get through this big swirly twirly part, you end up in the Sea of Eden. There are three Kraken, Krakens, which are easily defeated, and then you fight Ness's Nightmare, or the gold statue from earlier in the game. I forgot what my strategy here was. I believe I attacked with like my carry, because obviously my wasn't my PSI power was named after Mariah Carey. Uh, would heal when I got kind of mortal damage, and then I used a bunch of restore PP items when I ran out, uh, and I literally, I thought, almost died, and I barely defeated this guy. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, these battle battles are n- not to be taken lightly. I would say this guy is probably the toughest battle in the game. Yeah, especially if you aren't prepared, he he can kill you and put you in a really bad spot, like within like a two turns. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. So I mean. Uh, like very difficult and afterwards you get this weird they do this random number generator for no reason so you get you could get less but you get 200,000 experience so you gain a bunch of levels as well as all of your stats get buffed up by roughly like anywhere from two to five points I think I got and then you get like a bunch of health power and a bunch of pp so I got the experience, I leveled up, I got mostly fours or five, so I was fairly lucky, and I've got like a buck ton of PP and health points. So I'm just a walking tank at this point. Yeah, if you felt strong before, all of a sudden you feel unstoppable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it was like, I mean, it was it was fine, but at the same time I was like, man, imagine having to like play through that and not getting like all the extra power buffs and getting like a weak one. So it's kind of weird that this game just randomly throws in a like random number generator so yeah it's i i don't know how i feel about it like i I like it when it's like it obviously rolls in your favor but yeah if it didn't roll in your favor more often than not i think you'd be like so up that that could break this game people would be like what the hell especially if the game scaled differently or like scales like as it does you kind of do need to be as strong as it gives you a boost yeah so. Yeah, very true. So we do wake up from our dream coma thing, all super fully powered, and we go on to Saturn Valley. Here, Jeff's dad says he needs a piece of the meteor, so we head home. We do some final grinding against some fairly tough enemies before we return to Do- Dr. Astronaut. Then I stocked up on uh, brain food meals, I think I gave those to Pooh, multi-bottle rockets, which I gave to Jeff, and super plush teddy bears, which I gave to Paula. We then enter the transport machine and find ourselves in a dead-end area. Da- Dr. Astronaut comes and tells us that we must become robots for no random reason, so we can travel back in time. It's kind of like the opposite of Terminator. Yeah, because <laughs> you're going to a future where no biological form can live okay that's how that works interesting but you, you can't come back yes if, if yeah so you're gonna be stuck as a robot for forever if you do this do you want to continue we sure do so we become robots right. and we travel to the last area of the game uh fine oh yeah a note i never used pose secondary star power attack because for some reason it just never came up so sad Hmm. But we make our way through, not too tough of areas, and we enter the final cave in the wall. We fight 
After walking on a bunch of intestines, we fight Gygus in his true epic form, which he has three of them. The first is Gygus and Pokey. If you focus all your attacks on Pokey, you shouldn't have an issue. The second one, second form, uh, I think I used Ness's like carry level four. Paula and Pooh used Freeze, and Jeff used his Bazooka, and then I just basically healed as necessary. Uh, yes, I f forget where. <clears throat> feel like there's one more stage that I'm missing. So the first one is him and Pokey. The next one is you just attacking him. And then the screen goes all kind of wonky. And you end up con like in des with Desperation Gygus is the final one. Where you just basically have to keep everyone alive. And Paula has to pray nine times for the game to be over. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. So yes. the first one, it's all the characters and friends throughout the game that you've helped. Then... Uh, give you a little prayer or something like that so it's the runaway five or the saturn valley guys or your mom and then it kind of gets to the point where they're like i can't think of anyone else to help us pray who could it be and then all of a sudden they say oh i know who it could it be and at one point in the game you're supposed to input your name like the player's name and it says tyson or mick i think i was like one two three link one two three link because i thought that was funny can pray and only he can save us now and stop Gygus. So it then flashed to like yourself and you were supposed to like help pray and help your characters encourage them on to win the game, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. Well, it makes it it's a little bit more interactive than just this is I feel like this game put a lot of time and effort into the the finale wrap up of this mm -hmm. game. So Yeah. It shows oh, I agree hundred percent. So the end game. You can say goodbye to your team have a chance to explore the world, the now saved world, before looking at your photo album, which is the credits. But after the credits, we wake up and hearing a knocking on the door. It's Pokey's brother dropping a note that reads, Come and find me if you can, Pokey. The end? Yeah. What a jerk. That guy's just such a pain in the ass. I'm, I was so mad when we just didn't get him. Yeah. Did not get him. I think he does come back into playing the Mother 3. So if you really hate Pokey, you could look into playing Mother 3 to find out what exactly happened to this little guy. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So uh, with that, current thoughts on this game. I think this game is absolutely amazing. It's not... It's big, but it's not huge. It's easy to follow, but it doesn't hold your hand. It's difficult, but not impossible. I feel like... I needed a time to digest after I wrote these notes and after I played the game. Uh, but, like, and I was, because I was trying to determine if I liked this game or if I liked Chrono Trigger more. So at some point, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe it is today. We should look back and look at our Mario RPGs, and Chrono Triggers, Final Fantasy IIs, and Earthbound and say, which of those are the best RPGs for the Super Nintendo? Hmm. That would be interesting to see because after when we first started this podcast, I didn't we didn't watch or I didn't play any of these really. So it'd be interesting to see where where I fall now that I've uh, now that I've, we've played a fair chunk of them. It's like, which one truly is the best? Because some of these, like this ending, kind of like uh, kind of tears you up. That well, the you didn't get, get didn't get pokey. Well, they also do the whole fake out. So. Yeah, and like they have this like moment where you have to pray with them, and it's like trying to be very inclusive, and you went on this big adventure with all these friends, and then you can actually at the end of the, go and explore, and you can talk to, like spend hours talking to every single person in the game, and uh, I mean you can have this big experience, and they made this very unique, fun world. Um, I, so I mean, it, it is tough to look at versus like. Chrono Trigger. Chrono Trigger had lots of different endings, and they meant for lots of replays. Where, where is this? Like each experience was supposed to be completely unique, and uh, it was supposed to mean something, right? Like it wasn't you're just playing to get a score; you were playing be t to change the the world, right? So, I don't know. It's different. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that there. this game. I think we can definitively say that this game spawned on um, what's the game that came out. With like the underworld and stuff, Undertale. Like I think yes. you can pretty pretty definitively yes. say that Undertale and this are like very similar, right? So 
Yeah. Um, I wasn't the creator of Undertale the guy that did a lot of the translation for Mother Three. Uh, Mother Three. I think so. Yeah. 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 So. So, and then the other thing I wanted to bring up, I made a note of, is why don't people talk about this being like the prototype for Pokemon? You have a hero with a hat. You need to find eight items to un- like go through the whole world find eight items so you can get to like the final one there's like the isometric camera angle i don't know pokemon <laughs> i think i think you have a lot more like you should be a lot more praising of earthbound than you are you tame yeah. wild animals that you fight huh it's like pokemon they, they should at least be like hey look let let's give a little like nod or an easter egg or two to uh in the new pokemon games to earthbound i think that would just be perfect mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I, that was kind of our take on Earthbound. Good game, great game. Tyson, do you have any kind of final things to say? Um, <clears throat> I really liked it. Like, it's one of those games that I didn't know how I was going to feel going into it because it's so cute, cutesy. But once you kind of get a couple hours into this game and you get a good grasp of how difficult it actually is and how much... Uh, there's a little bit like if they kind of hold your hand to start and then once you're into the game it can get like if you don't know what you're doing in a battle you can really uh put yourself in a bad spot and have to digging digging your way out of that a lot of fun rewarding especially if you do like oh this this ma- this uh battles right off and you end up battling back and keep everybody alive like there's that's very satisfying so this game this game's quite good. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Yes. Uh, so most, like most of our second part shows, one of the things we were doing was we were doing report cards for them. So I figured we should keep that tradition alive. Uh, so in terms of this game's story, Tyson, I gave this game an A. What would you give it? Mm, I'd probably have to give it like an A as well. Right. In terms of price so for physical or an original cart or the snes classic i gave this an f i think they should make this game a little bit more abundant or scalpers or like secondhand dealerships shouldn't spend so much but for a digital copy 12 bucks for this game that's excellent yeah that's really decent especially on the 3ds like i was just uh playing busted out the old 2ds just to load it up and see what i even had for it i see what games i had Mm -hmm. on it and I was like looking, uh, and I saw Earthbound on there, and like a link to the past, and you're like, twelve bucks for a Super Nintendo game. And there's a lot of decent, uh, like all the Donkey Kong yep. Country games are on there. It's like this is fantastic. Uh, what they did with the the 3DS was really something special. So that one also gets an A, but physical, oh man, you're totally in the right area. Fail, fail for nice. sure. I gave. You know what? Right across the boards, music, gameplay, and replayability. I gave A's right there. So outside of how much it costs to get a physical copy of original copy of this game, I gave this game an A. Yeah, this one it's it's something special, and I I'm kicking myself now for all these years of not going, not just picking up and playing it. It's like messed out. Oh yes. But we've now played it and experienced it. And yes, at some point we will go back and look at our top 10 lists and do a revamped one. We'll probably start with the NES because I think we're basically outside of the next game wrapped up. And we'll talk about it. So it's kind of exciting. So what would you change? So let's put that critical hat on for a second and use our brain powers to think. How would we change this game if we wanted to? So, most of the time I have a pretty good idea of what I want to change, what I want to alter. Uh, and then sometimes I was hoping actually this our discussion on today's podcast would bring something up. I literally have nothing. I think this game is perfect top to bottom. I, yeah, nothing. Um, the only thing I can think of, maybe something along the lines where if you got stuck... But if you bought this game when you were a when you were a kid, you got the the actual like strategy uh, guide, as well as there's a guide in every guide. town, a hint guide that you can just pay and he tells you where to go. So yeah, yeah, I guess uh, I guess you're right. I would I'd have to. I don't think I'd change anything. The so. only thing like I'm being nitpicky is when you go into a battle, you see your actions on the top. You don't see any of your characters. It's just a psychedelic background with the characters, like the enemy sprite. Maybe 
more of like a traditional where you see my guy like you see attacks or something like that you could make the game a little bit more fun or even like the pokemon the over the shoulder look something just to switch up because i mean the battling is very bland in a sense where it's just like the commands right so yeah yeah i guess, I guess you could do you could argue that they could change that but man it's this game's so fantastic like how did i i guess it, that literally that ad campaign really just shot it in yep. the foot to before like that one ad campaign that guy that suggested that in the meeting should just feel like feel so ashamed yeah. he ruined a uh, whole generation's chance at a great game Very true so a final i think that's a pretty good recap uh there were some sluggish parts i definitely struggled reading a couple times and the flow wasn't right like i think one of our episodes we did i really liked how can everything flowed together and i think our sections seemed a little off but what you, what you're gonna do i think it's a pretty good show and a final are you buying it and then we're out of here so i wrote up a theory last time that this everyone in this world believes in predestination i still think that theory holds up where everyone just believes ness is the child of destiny and they're doing anything they can to help them so i think that's still true yeah 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 i didn't get any evidence to change my mind All right. and now the big one if you've heard of earthbound the first thing i think i ever heard of earthbound was that this game is about an abortion the earthbound is a story of a horrific rape the fi- finale of the game sees us approaching a giant slit in a cave wall between two pillars. Once inside, we walk along intestines up to a, like, basically what looks like a cervix-looking image. During the battle, uh, we look at a, he- a screaming head that can also be... Uh, we look at what something looks like kind of like a screaming head or a ghost... But if you pull it back, it actually kind of looks like a baby from an ultrasound. It tells us to stop and that it wants to live. It's kind of a dark theme to end such a lighthearted adventure. Tyson, are you buying this abortion theory? I, yeah, I don't know. I I don't, not, not really, because I don't see where that would come from. Even just looking at... Yeah, even just looking at, uh, like, the whole, like, it, oh, it looks like a fetus. It clearly looks like a spooky ghost face. <laughs> yeah, but but uh, it, it is one of those, like, double images. Like, it's definitely a ghost face, but once you see the fetus image, you can't unsee it, you know? Uh, fair enough. I haven't seen it. Okay, so. well, uh, yeah, I'll post a picture, and then maybe I'll post, like, another picture the next day or something. Or I'll see if I can find, like, a dual picture where somebody outlines it. And it's definitely one of those things that's, like... Look at this duck, but it's also a woman's head, and you're like, "What the fuck?" It's one of those kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm really buying it. I think the game's too lighthearted and kind of carefree to be about. Although, the theme of motherhood, because in the first game, you have to show Gygus the, his mother, his mom's lullaby to to stop him, and in this game, in theory, you have to like abort him to kill i don't know it seems like it's over my head it's a cool theory i like when people put this together and just adds more lore and gives us something to talk about and look up right so i'll give them credit for that but other than that i'm not giving them a lot of credit so yeah yeah nice yeah good game all right so another rpg in the book these are always hard to get through so we've done it we've done four super nintendo rpgs so it's pretty exciting yeah proud of us all right well we're going to say goodbye, and we'll see you for episode 49 before episode 50. It's coming. Look at that. We're getting so mature. Yeah. Fast approaching. I can't believe it's, uh, it's upon I know. us. I remember like being back in like the 40s, and we're trying to figure out like the, the road that we were going to go down to get to this. We're almost there. It's pretty yeah. exciting. Insane. All right. So thank you for listening. You can contact Potendo. At, on email at podtendo at e- gmail.com check us out on twitter at twitter.com no at podtendo podcast check us on facebook at facebook.com slash podtendo we're on youtube at youtube.com slash podtendo i've been mick that was mick? no tyson i'm mick you're tyson <laughs> sorry i thought you cut out there all i heard i heard like a little click, and i was like oh did that just cut out sorry yeah. sorry Sorry, no, it's Tyson right. here. <laughs> Just being All stupid. Right. Well, we're saying goodbye, so bye. 
I think Bye. that's the ending. Yeah, I like that ending. That's good. Bye. Yeah. No, keep that <laughs> in there. <laughs>